Chapter 8, page 60. Something stepped on a little stick. As soon as the twig cracked, my eyes snapped open and I was wide awake. I held my breath and kept as still as I could. Whatever it was that was sneaking up on me knew I'd woke up because it stopped moving and kept as still as it could too. Even though my head was still under my blanket, I could feel two eyes staring at me real hard and I knew these weren't critter eyes. These eyes made the hair on the back of my neck raise up the way only human bean eyes can do. Without wiggling or jiggling around too much under my blanket, I got my fingers wrapped around my jackknife. Right when I was ready to push the covers off of me and start running or stabbing, whoever it was that had been watching jumped right on top of me. I was as trapped as a roach under a dish rag. I tried to guess the exact spot that the person's heart was at, then pulled my knife back. A voice said, If you ain't a kid called Bud from the home, I'm really sorry about jumping on you like this. It was Bugs. When I tried to talk, it felt like I had to suck all the air out of Flint. I finally got breathing right and said, Doggone it, Bugs, it is me. You nearly scared me to death. He got off of me and I threw the blanket over to the side. You don't know how lucky you are. I was just about fixing to stab you in the heart. Bugs looked like he knew he just had a real close call. He said, I'm sorry, Bud. I didn't mean to scare you, but everyone knows how you like to sleep with that knife open, so I figured I'd best grab hold of you so as you wouldn't wake up slicing nobody. Shucks. Even though it was Bugs who'd come real close to getting his heart poked, I was the one who was still having trouble catching my breath. I asked, how come you aren't back at the home? But before he had a chance to answer, I knew. You're on the lam. Page 62. <clears throat> Bugs said, yep, I'm going back to riding the rails. When I heard about you beating that kid up so bad that you had to take off, I figured it was time for me to get going, too. I thought you might be hanging around the library, so I'd come down to see if you wanted to go with me. Where are you heading? There's always fruits to be picked out west. I heard we can make enough money to get by out there. There's supposed to be a train leaving sometime tomorrow. Did you really beat that kid up in the foster home? I said, "Uh uh-huh, we kind of had a fight. How long does it take to get out west? Bugs said, Depends on how many trains you got to hop. Was he really two years older than you? Uh Uh-huh, he was 12. Is it fun to hop a train? Some of the time it is. Some of the time it's scary. We heard he was kind of big, too. Was he? I said, he was pretty big. I can't see how we can hop on a train. They look like they're moving pretty doggone fast. Bug said, most times you don't hop when you're going fast. Most times you try to climb on one when it's sitting in the train yard. Did the guy cry after you whooped him? Well, kind of. He looked real scared and told his mama to keep me away from him. They even said I was a hoodlum. Will we be sleeping on the train and everything? Sure we will. Some of the time the train don't stop for two or three days. Man, I always try to tell people that just because someone's skinny don't mean they can't fight. You're a hero now, bud. Nah, I didn't really do nothing much. Well, how about the toilet? How are we going to use the toilet if the train doesn't stop? Bug said, you just kind of lean out of the door and go. When the train is still moving... Yeah, you get a real nice breeze. Oh, man, that sounds great. Count me in. I can't wait. Bug spit a big glob of slob in his hand and said, I knew I could depend on you, bud. I spit a big glob in my hand and said, We're brothers forever, bugs. We slapped our hands together as hard as we could and got our slobs mixed up mixed up real good, then waved them in the air so they'd dry. Now it was official. I finally had a brother. Bug said, We'll go down to the mission. There's bound to be someone there that knows about where we can hop this train. They will be on the lamb together. We found out that we'd have to go to a city called Hooperville, just outside of Flint. The only trouble was nobody knew exactly where Hooperville was. It was dark before we found out the right direction. I'd never heard of a city that was so doggone hard to find. We walked on a trail through some woods that run right up against Thread Creek. We could tell we were getting close to Hooperville because we heard somebody playing a mouth organ and the smell of food cooking was getting stronger. We kept walking in the direction that the sky was glowing with an orangish light. When we could hear the music real clear and folks talking to each other and the sound of sticks cracking in a fire, we started cutting through the trees. That way we could peek into Hooperville first. Hooperville first. We looked out from behind a big tree and saw that a big wind or even two or three big wolves huffing and puffing real hard could blow Hooperville into the next county. It was a bunch of huts and shacks thrown together out of pieces of boxes and wood and cloth. The Amos's shed would have looked like a real fancy house here. Right near our tree was the big fire that had been lighting up the sky. It looked like a hundred people were sitting around it. 
watching things burn or waiting for the food cooking in three big pots set up in the fire. There were two little, littler fires burning in Hooperville. One had a pot that was big enough to boil a whole person in it. A man was stirring things in the pot with a big stick, and when he raised the stick up, he pulled some britches or a shirt out and passed it over to a white man who was hanging the clothes on a line to dry. There was a mountain of clothes on the ground next to him waiting on their turn. The other fire in Hooperville was real small. It was off to the side by itself. There were five white people sitting at this fire, two kids, a man, and a woman holding a little wrapped up baby. The baby sounded like all those new sick babies at the home. It was coughing like it was a half-dead little animal. Bugs whispered, Shoot, this ain't no city. This is just another cardboard jungle. A what? A cardboard jungle. Somewhere you can get off the train and clean up and get something to eat without the cops chasing you out of town. I said, Well, what are we going to do? We can't just go bust into the city and expect someone to feed us, can we? Bugs said, One of us has got to talk to them. Let's flip for it. Okay. Bugs rumbled around in his pocket and found a penny. He rubbed it up against his britches and said, Heads I win, tails you lose. Okay. He flipped the penny up into the air and caught it, then slapped it down on the back of his left hand. Page 66. He peeked underneath his right hand to see, and a big smile cracked his face. Shucks! Bug said, Tails, you lose. Dang, so what should I say? Ask them if this is Hooperville. See if they got any extra food. I moved out from behind a tree and walked over toward the biggest fire. I waited until some folks noticed me and said, Excuse me, is this here Hooperville? The man who was playing the mouth organ stopped and everyone else around the fire looked up at me. One of the white men said, What is it you looking for? I said, A city called Hooperville, sir. They all laughed. The mouth organ man said, Nah, son, what are you looking for is Hooverville with a V like in President Herbert Hoover. I said, Oh, is this it, sir? The man said, This is one of them. I said, One of them? He answered, They're all over the country. This here is the Flint version. And all of them were called Hooverville? That's right. Mr. Hoover works so hard at making sure every city has got one that it seems like it would be criminal to call them anything else. Someone said, that's the truth. I said, well, how are we going to know if we're in the right one? The mouth organ man said, are you hungry? Yes, sir. Are you tired? Yes, sir. Are you scared about what's going to happen tomorrow? I don't want anyone to think I was a baby. So I said, not exactly scared, sir. Maybe I'm a little bit nervous. The man smiled and said, Well, son, any place where there are other folks in need of the same things that you are is the right place to be. This is exactly the Hooverville you're looking for. I knew what the man was trying to say. This was the exact same kind of circle talking and cross talking that Mama used to do. Bugs hadn't had that kind of practice. He came from behind the tree and said, I don't get it. You said there were Hoovervilles all over the place. What if we was looking for the Hooverville in Detroit or Chicago? How could this be the right one to be in? The man said, You boys from Flint? I said, Yes, sir. The man waved his mouth organ like a magic wand and pointed at all over the little cardboard city. Boys, he said, Look around you. The city was bigger than I thought it was. The raggedy little huts were in every direction you looked. Page 68. And there were more people sitting around than I first thought, too. Mostly it was men and big boys, but there were a couple of women every now and then and a kid or two. They were all the colors you could think of, black, white, and brown, but the fire made everyone look like they were different shades of orange. There were dark orange folks sitting next to medium orange folks sitting next to light orange folks. All these people, the mouth organ man said, are just like you. They're tired, hungry, and a little bit nervous about tomorrow. This here is the right place for you all to be because we're all in the same boat, and you boys are nearer to home than you'll ever get. Someone said, Amen, brother. The mouth organ man said, it don't matter if you're looking for Chicago or Detroit or Orlando or Oklahoma City. I rode the rails to all of them. You might think or you might hear that things are better just down the line, but they're singing the same sad song all over this country. Believe me, son, being on the road is no good. If you two boys are from Flint, this is the right Hooverville for you. Someone said, Brother, why don't we feed these boys? That one looks like he ain't at in two or three months. Shucks, he didn't have to point or nothing. Everyone knew who he meant. But I didn't care. The food that was bubbling up in those three big pots even sounded delicious. The mouth organ man said, You're welcome to join us, but we all pitch in here. So as unless either one of you is carrying one of them smoked West Virginia hams in them bags, looks like you'll be pulling KP tonight. I said, Pulling what, sir? He said, KP, kitchen please. You do the cleanup after everyone's had their fill. There are a couple other young folks who will show you what you have to do. 
Me and Bugs both said, Yes, sir. This seemed like a real good trade. A woman handed me and Bugs each a flat, square, empty tin can. That, my lord, is your china. Please be careful not to chip it. My china had the words Jumbo A&P Sardines stamped into the bottom of it. She handed us two beat-up old spoons and said, Don't be shy. You two just about missed supper. You'd best hurry up. She took us over to one of the big pots and filled up our tin plates. You're lucky, she said. It's muskrat stew, and there's plenty left over tonight. Eat as much as you can. The stew is made out of dandelion greens and a couple of potatoes and some small wild carrots and some crawdads and a couple of little chunks of meat. It tasted great. We both even got seconds. When we were done, the woman told us, You boys leave your bags here. It's time to do the dishes now. Page 70. Uh-oh. Ma'am, I'd like to keep my suitcase with me wherever I go. I promise you your suitcase will be safe here. I remembered the Amoses had promised the same thing. I said, You'll watch it yourself, ma'am? You'll make sure no one looks inside of it? She said, Son, we don't have no thieving here. We all look out for each other. I said, Thank you, ma'am, and put my suitcase down near the woman's feet. Me, Bugs, a little white boy, and a little girl loaded a whole mess of dirty tin cans and spoons and a couple of real plates and forks into a big wooden box and lugged them down to Thread Creek. The little girl had been in Hooverville the longest, so she got to tell the rest of us what to do. She said, I don't suppose neither one of you new boys knows how to do the dishes right away, do you? Me and Bugs had done tons of dishes in the home, so I said, sure we do. We used to be real good at cleaning up. Bugs said, dang, girl, you act like this is the first cardboard jungle I've been in. I know how you do dishes out here. She said, okay, then we'll split them up. You and you, she pointed at Bugs and the other kid, can do half, and me and this boy can do the others. What's your name? I said, Bud, not Buddy. She said, I'm Deza Malone. Deza handed Bugs and the other little boy some rags and some soap powder, and they started splashing the dishes in the water. Me and the girl walked a little farther up the creek and started unloading the rest of the dishes. You dry, I'll wash, she said. She handed me a rag, and just as soon as she'd splash one of the tin cans in the water and give it to me, I'd dry it and stick it in the wooden box. She said, where you say you was from? Flint, right here. So you and your friend come down here to get on the train, that train tomorrow? Where's it going? Chicago, she said. Is that west from here? Uh-huh. Then, yep, that's where we're heading, I said. Where are you from? Lancaster, Pennsylvania. You going to take the train, too? She said, uh, uh uh-uh, my daddy is. Folks say there's work out west, so he's going to try again. So you're going to wait here for him? Uh Uh-huh. She was real fast at washing the dishes. But I noticed she kind of got slow and was touching my hand a lot when it came time to giving them to me. She said, where's your mom and daddy? My mother died four years ago. Sorry to hear that. It's okay, she didn't suffer anything. So where's your daddy? I think he lives in Grand Rapids. I never met him. Sorry to hear that. Shuck, she held right onto my hand when she said that. I squirmed my hand loose and said, That's okay, too. Deza said, No, it's not, and you should quit pretending that it is. Who said I'm pretending anything? I know you are. My daddy says families are the most important thing there is. That's why me and my mom are going to wait together for him to come back or write for us to come to him. I said, My mother said the same thing, that families should be there for each other all the time. She always used to tell me that no matter where I went or what I did, that she'd be there for me, even if she wasn't somewhere that I could see her. She told me, Shucks, there's some folks who'll have you running your mouth before you know what you're doing. I quit talking and acted like I was having a real hard time drawing the tin. She can, she just handed me. Page 73. What'd she tell you, bud? I looked at Deezam alone and figured I'd never see her again in my life, so I kept shooting off my mouth. She would tell me every night before I went to sleep that no matter what happened, I would sleep knowing that there had never been a little boy anywhere, anytime, who was loved more than she loved me. She told me that as long as I remembered that, I'd be okay. And you knew it was the truth? Just as much as I know my name's Bud, not Buddy. She said, Don't you have no other kin here in Flint? No. I guess I can't blame you for wanting to ride the rails. My mama says these poor kids on the road all alone are like dust in the wind. But I guess you're different, aren't you, Bud? I guess you sort of carry your family around inside of you, huh? I guess I do. Inside my suitcase, too. She said, So you've been staying in an orphanage since your mama died? What makes you say that? Well, you're kind of skinny, but I can tell by the way you talk and the way you act that you haven't been out on the road for very long. You still look young. I said, Shucks, I'm not all that young. 
I'm going to be 11 on November 14th, and I'm not skinny, I'm wiry. Some folks think I'm a hero. So, Mr. Hero, we're the same age, but you have been staying in an orphanage? I've been staying in a home. My daddy says being on the road ain't fit for a dog, much less a kid. How come you don't just go back to your orphanage? She started up touching my hand too much again. Deza Malone seemed like she was all right, so I came, came clean with her. Don't tell no one, but I lit out from a foster home, so I'm on the lam, and I wouldn't go back to the home if I could. It's getting so there's too many kids in there. So? That's better than being cold and hungry and all the time and dodging the railroad police. What do you mean? You don't think they just let people jump on the trains, do you? Well, I guess I hadn't thought about it. See, I knew you were too nice to have been out on the road. You're going to have a bad surprise tomorrow morning. That won't bother me too much, she said. Oh, yeah, I forgot. You're a hero to some folks. When Deza smiled, a little dimple jumped up in her brown cheek. I didn't answer. I just kept drying tin cans. We got to the last four or five tin can plates, and Deza said, You ever kiss a girl at the orphanage? Uh-oh. Are you kidding? No. Why, you afraid of girls? You must be kidding. She said, Okay, and closed her eyes and mooshed her lips up and leaned close to me. Dingy! If I didn't kiss her, she'd think I was scared of girls. If I did kiss her, she might blab or bugs might see me and tell strangers about what happened. I looked down the creek to where Bugs and the other boy were still splashing in the water. It was dark enough that I didn't think they could see us too good. I scooched my lips up and mashed my face on Deez and Malone's. We stuck like that for a hot second, but it felt like a long time. When I opened my eyes and pulled back, Deez kept her clothes and smiled. She looked down and stuck her hand in mine again, and this time I let her keep it there. She looked out at the creek in the woods on the other side and said, Isn't this romantic? I looked out to see what she was talking about. The only thing I could see was the moon like a big egg yolk way up in the sky. You could hear the water and the sound of the mouth organ playing a sad song back in Hooverville. I sneaked another peek at Deez's dimple. She said, You hear that? That's Shenandoah he's playing. Isn't it pretty? I guess so. Do you know the words? Page 76. Uh-huh. Listen. It's been seven long years since last I've seen her. Way hey, you rollin' river. Been seven long years since last I've seen her. Way hey, I'm bound away. Cross the wide, Miss Hooray. I said, yep, that's a sad song. I didn't think it was pretty at all. She squeezed my hand and said, isn't it? It's about an Indian man and woman who can't see each other for seven years. But in all that time, they still stay in love no matter what happens. It reminds me of my mother and father. Your dad's been gone for seven years before? She looked out over the creek like the big, eggy moon had her hypnotized. I pulled my hand from hers and said, Well, that's just about it for the dishes. She smiled again. Bud, I'll never forget this night. I didn't tell her, but I probably wouldn't forget it either. I'd practiced on the back of my hand before, but this was the first time I'd ever busted slob with a real live girl. We loaded all the dishes in the box and walked down to Bugs and the other kid. We put their dishes on top of ours and headed back. Page 77. Bug said, How come you're looking so strange, bud? You look like you've been chunked in the head with a rock. Deza Malone laughed, and for a second I thought she was going to rat me out. I said, I don't know, I guess that song is making me kind of sad. Bug said, Yeah, it is kind of sad. Right before we got into the cardboard jungle, we passed the white people with the coughing baby at their own little fire. I said to Deza, How come they're off alone? They aren't allowed to sit around the big fire because that baby's making so much noise? Deza said, uh uh-uh. uh, they had been invited, but my daddy said you got to feel sorry for them. All the reading is dandelion green soup. They're broke, their clothes are falling off of them, their baby's sick. But when someone took them food and blankets, the man said, Thank you very much, but we're white people. We ain't in need of a handout. When we got back to the main fire of Hooverville, we put the dishes in another box. Deza made us turn them all upside down so as if the rain got into them, they wouldn't rust. I went to the woman with a suitcase. It was in the same spot I'd left it, and the knots in the twine were the kind I tie. I said, thank you very much, ma'am. She said, I told you not to worry. I went back to the big fire to sit with bugs. The mouth organ man said, I suppose you were going out on that train tomorrow. I said, the one for Chicago, sir? He said, that's the one. I said, yes, we are, sir. He said, well, you'd best get as much sleep as you can. It's supposed to be pulling out at 5.15, but you never know with these freights. We got in one of the shacks with some other boys. Bugs was snoring in two seconds, but I couldn't sleep. I opened my jackknife and put it under my blanket. I was thinking, Deez's mama was right. 
Someone who doesn't know who their family is is like dust blowing around in a storm. They don't really belong any one place. I started wondering if going to California was the right thing to do. I might not know who my family was, but I knew they were out there somewhere. And it seemed to make a whole lot more sense to think that they were somewhere around Flint instead of out west. I opened my suitcase to get my blanket. Even though I trusted the woman who guarded it for me, I checked to make sure everything was okay. I picked up the tobacco pouch that had my rocks in it and pulled the drawstring open. I shook the five smooth stones out and looked at them. They'd been in the drawer after the ambulance took Mom away, and I'd had them ever since. Page 79. Someone had took a pen or something and had written on all five of them, but it was written a code so I couldn't understand what they meant. One of them said, Kentland, ill, 5, 10, 11. Another said, Luguti, in, 5, 16, 11. Then there was Sturgis M, 8, 30, 12. And Gary N, 6, 13, 12. And the last one said Flint M, 8, 11, 11. I put them back in their pouch and pulled the string tight. Then I pulled out the envelope that had the picture of the saggy pony at the misbegotten moon park. It was fine. Next, I counted the fires again. All five were there. I slid all of them back except for the blue one. I held it up so it could catch some of the light from the big fire. I kept looking at the picture and wondering why this one bothered Mama so much. The more I thought about it, the more I knew this man just had to be my father. Why else would Mama keep these? I used a little trick to help me fall off to sleep. I pulled my blanket right up over my head and breathed in the smell real deep. After doing this three times, the smells of the shack in Hooverville were gone, and only the smell of the blanket was in my nose. And that smell always reminded me of Mama and how she used to read me to sleep every night. I took two more breaths and pretended I was hearing Mama reading to me about the billy goat scruff, or the fox and the grapes, or the dog that saw his reflection in the water, or some other story. She checked out of the library. I could hear Mama's voice getting farther and farther away as I imagined I was in the story, until finally her voice and the story all mixed into one. I'd learned that it was best to be asleep before Mama finished the story, because if she got done and I was still awake, she'd always tell me what the story was about. I never told Mama, but that always ruined the fun of the story. Shocks, here I was thinking I was just hearing something funny about a fox or a dog, and Mama spoiled it by telling me there were really lessons about not being greedy or not wishing for things you couldn't have. I took two more breaths and started thinking about the little hen that baked the bread. I heard, not I, said the pig, not I, said the goat, not I, said the big bad wolf, then, whoop, zoop, zoop. I was asleep. I started dreaming about the man with the giant fiddle. He was walking away, and I kept calling him, but he couldn't look back. Then the dream got a lot better. I turned away from where Hermione Callaway was, and there stood Deza Malone. I told her, I really like your dimple. She laughed and said, See you in seven years. A man screamed, Get up! They're trying to sneak it out early! I jumped straight up and banged my head on the top of the shack. I ran outside. It was still dark, and the fire was just a pile of glowing sticks. The man was screaming at the top of his lungs, Get up! There, fire the engine are fixing to take off! Bugs and the other boys came and stood next to me. Bugs said, Is it a raid? Someone said, No, they're trying to sneak out before we get up. People started running all over Hooverville. Bugs said, Come on, bud, get your stuff. We've got to get on that train. I folded my blanket up and put it in my suitcase and tied the twine back. I put my jackknife in my pocket and Bugs and I ran outside. I hadn't gotten six giant steps away when a boy stuck his head out of the door and yelled, Hey, Slim, is this your paper? I looked back. My blue flyer. I forgot to put it back in the suitcase. Bugs said, hurry, I'll wait. I'll catch you. Go ahead. I ran back and took my flyer from the boy. Thanks a lot. I ran back out into the crowd that was tearing through the woods. There were a million men and boys running in the same direction. I didn't want to fold the flyer up, so as I was running, I slid it between the twine and the suitcase. I put it back inside once we got on the train. No one was talking. All you could hear were the sounds of a million feet smacking on the trail and the sound of a million people trying to catch their breath. Finally, a hiss sound started getting louder and louder, and I knew we weren't too far away. We broke out of the woods, and there in the dark sat the train. The locomotive was hissing and spitting coal black smoke into the sky. Every once in a while, a big shower of sparks would glow up from inside the dark cloud, making it look like a gigantic black genie was trying to raise up out of the smokestack. The train went as far back as you could see. There must have been a thousand boxcars. But everyone had stopped and was just standing there watching. No one was trying to get on. 
I pushed my way to the front to see if I could find bugs, and I saw, saw why everyone had stopped. There were four cop cars and eight cops standing between the crowd and the train. The cops all had billy clubs and were spread out to protect the train. The crowd kept getting bigger and bigger. One of the cops yelled, You men know you can't get on this train. Just go on back to Shantytown, and there won't be no trouble. A white man said, This is the only train going west for the next month. You know we got families to feed and have to be, have got to be on it. You go get back in your cars and you'll be right. There won't be no trouble. The cop said, I'm warning you. The Flint police are on the way. This here is private property and they have orders to shoot anyone who tries to get on this train. A man next to me said, I'd rather be shot than sit around and watch my kids go hungry. The cop said, this is America, boys. You sound like a bunch of commies. You know I can't let you on this train. I got kids to feed too and I'd lose my job. Someone yelled, well, welcome to the club, brother. It seemed like we stood looking at the cops and them looking at us for a whole hour. Our side was getting bigger and bigger, and the other cops started looking nervous. The one who was doing all the talking saw them fidgeting and said, Hold steady, men. One of the cops said, Jake, there's 400 men out there and more coming. I don't like these odds. Mr. Pinkerton ain't paying me enough to do this. He threw his cop hat and his billy club on the ground. Everybody froze when the train whistle blew one long time, and the engine started saying, Shh, shh, shh. The big steel wheels creaked a couple of times and started moving. Four of the other cops threw their hats and billy clubs down, too. The boss cop said, You lily-livered rats! And it was like someone said, On your mark, get set, go. The engine was saying, Shh, 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 shh. And a million boys and men broke for the train. Page 84. I got pushed from behind and fell on top of my suitcase. Someone reached down and pulled me up. I squeezed my bag to my stomach and ran. The train was going faster and faster. People were jumping on and reaching back to help others. I finally got to the tracks and was running as hard as I could. I looked up into the boxcar and saw Bugs. He screamed, Bud, throw your bag! Throw me your bag! I used both hands to throw my suitcase at the train. Bugs caught it, and when he set it behind him, the blue fire blew out of the twine and fluttered outside the door. But it was like a miracle. The fire flipped over three times and landed right in my hand. I slowed down and put it in my pocket. Bugs reached one arm out and screamed, Bud, don't stop! Run! I started running again, but it felt like my legs were gone. The car with Bugs in it was getting farther and farther away. Finally, I stopped. Bugs was leaning out of the door and stopped reaching back for me. He waved and disappeared into the boxcar. A second later, my suitcase came flying out of the door. I walked over to where it landed and picked it up. Man, this is one tough suitcase. You couldn't even tell what had been through. It still looked exactly the same. I sat on the side of the tracks and tried to catch my breath. The train and my new pretend brother got farther and farther away, chugging to Chicago. Man, I'd found some family, and he was gone before we could really get to know each other. There were six or seven other people who didn't make the train, so we all walked back toward Hooverville. They must have lit the big fire again. The sky in that direction was glowing orange. The cop that first threw down his billy club walked over to us and said, He wasn't lying about the Flint police coming, but they're coming to bust up to Shantytown. You all should get out of here. When we got close to Hooverville, we heard four gunshots. We all spread into the woods and sneaked up to see what had happened. I peeked from behind a tree and could see a bunch of cops standing around with pistols out. All the men and boys and women that were left in Hooverville were bunched up on one side, and the cops were on the other. The fire had been lit and was burning bigger than ever, but now it was burning because the cops were tearing all the shacks down and were throwing the wood and cardboard and hunks of cloth into the middle of it. One of the cops dragged a big clothes washing pot over to the side and stuck his pistol down in it and shot four more times. Phew! Instead of shooting people, they were shooting holes into all the pots and pans. A man was yelling, You yellow belly lowlifes, you waited till you knew most of the men was gone, you cowards! The cops wouldn't talk or nothing. They just kept piling Flint's Hooverville into the fire. I tried to see if I could spot D's them alone, but there were too many people. It seemed like the only good thing that came out of going to Hooverville was that I finally kissed a girl. Maybe someone was trying to tell me something, but with me missing the train and the blue flyer floating back to me, maybe Deezem alone was right. Maybe I should stay here in Flint. I walked back farther into the woods and sat down. I pulled the blue flyer out of my pocket and opened my suitcase back up. I smoothed the flyer out and took another good look at it. Maybe it came floating back to me because this Herman E. Calloway really was my father. Wait a minute. I sat up. The names Caldwell and Calloway are a lot alike. 
Both of them have eight letters, and there aren't too many names that have a C, a A, a L, and a W all together like that. I remembered what I read in that little big book, Gangbusters. It said a good criminal chooses an alias that's kind of close to their own name. Except I couldn't figure out who was a criminal here and why anybody needed an alias. I wanted to stay and look for Deza and her mother, but it was too hard to hear all the people crying and arguing. Besides, I was still on the lam. I started walking. If I hurried, I could get breakfast at the mission.